After reflecting on the last five decades, I've come to realize that I have a story, one of my music and my sound, and the marvelous collaborations with friends and colleagues. With a little help from these friends, I will share with you the journey that has shaped my musical life. I suppose every musician has a story, and my story is not new, but it is mine. Welcome to The Path Taken, hosted by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick. Hello, everybody. This is Tom Farley, and we're up for another chapter or episode of The Path Taken, A Musician Story. And I got a really special guy, really special good buddy of mine on, on the line here today that we're going to be talking about his life and uh, leading up to the intersection of our lives and the recordings that he's done and where his music is going. And that's Mr. Barry Shoemate. So how's it going, Barry? Hey, Tom. It's going great. Great. Uh, thanks for having me on your podcast. I really appreciate it. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time, brother. You know, it's uh, uh, you know, it's it, time is important, but I, I really wanted to make sure we had our moment together on this because it's important. We have a a special kind of slant on things that people will find out as we go through the podcast. Uh, it's not just the music; it's the engineering, yes, which both of us have evolved in, in a similar way. And I really look forward to getting into that later on. Absolutely. But before we before we jump off uh, into that particular topic, uh, people need to know who you are. And uh, just exactly how you got started on this musical journey. So, uh, you know, start us at the beginning where you think is the beginning and then uh, take it from there. Okay. Um, so the beginning is really my falling in love with music. And that happened when I was in second grade, I think. My parents um, had a, a 50s party where everybody dressed up, in, you know, 50s style. Yeah. And the music they bought for that was the soundtrack to American Graffiti get out yep and so after the party they gave me the record it's actually a, a, a double album and i just played that thing to death i had this little record player in my bedroom and so i was in second grade and i knew, I knew the words to johnny be good and del shannon's runaway and the just every song on there so i just that's an awesome collection too. yeah it was, it was it was incredible um so and then I, you know, I started like an Elvis. I just really liked the fifties and early sixties music when I was, when I was little and then, uh, evolved into, you know, as everybody did in the, in the late seventies, I got into kiss a little bit. And then, uh, the thing that really changed my life musically was, was hearing Hey Jude for the first time Beatles. Really? Yeah. I just, I just, that's, it just, I just turned into, and that was probably maybe I was in eighth grade when I heard, when I heard that. And so I just turned into a Beatles freak and, uh, I still am. I still am every, every, you know, every couple of years I rediscovered different things about the Beatles and I'll get into just listening to nothing but the Beatles and, and how their engineering was. We're talking about engineering later, but, uh, with the stuff they did was really amazing with the equipment they had at the time. But, uh, oh, absolutely. So fast forward to my 10th grade year, uh, my buddies and I, went to see a concert at my high school. It was on a weeknight and there was, I think four or five student bands that played and, and most of them were punk rock, but there was one classic rock band that, that were really good. And that, that struck me. And, and these are guys that went to our high school and they were really good musicians. And so the next day at the, uh, before homeroom, one of the guys said, Hey, we should, we should be in a band. That'd be cool. And none of us knew how to play instruments. And uh, so they're like, yeah, it would be cool. And, uh, so we all, we all schemed, uh, it was in the fall. So we schemed to ask for instruments from our parents for Christmas. And Did they deliver? Yes. Yes. Actually, I wanted, I, I, I wanted to be a drummer, but, uh, a guy, a guy in our little group called drums first. And so I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> and then the, uh, the other guy called bass, the other guy said, I'll be the bass player. And then, uh, so I just said, I, I guess I'll be the guitar player. And so it's just dumb luck that I'm a guitar player now, you know, 40 some years later or whatever it is. But, uh, so we got our instruments and, uh, you know, just cheap. My, you know, my parents are going to spend, they weren't going to buy me a Les Paul for me to play it, you know, and put it in the closet. Get out of here. No, they, they didn't. So they got me this, uh, it was a Hondo, Hondo all-star one pickup, you know, Korean guitar or something. And then a little 10 yeah. watt amp. 
And then I started taking lessons. Um, I took lessons from a guy named Mike S who, uh, in, in, and I'm from Richmond, uh, Virginia. And Mike is, is the, the guitar God in Richmond. He teaches, uh, at VCU. Um, he taught the guy who, uh, he's the guitar player for Chicago. He's just taught hundreds of great guitar players and, and, and he's just an amazing instructor. So I took lessons. So all this is going, all this is going on in Richmond. In, yeah. I'm from Richmond. Um, yep. So, okay, cool. <clears throat> and so I took lessons and, uh, immediately started being in a band we didn't know how to play. We just get together and just make noise. And, uh, <laughs> we, we called it punk rock. <laughs> and so, but I started taking lessons and I started just really getting into it and, and practicing a lot. And I think I, I, I practiced probably five hours a day. I just, I just loved it so much. And I just practiced and practiced and practiced. And, uh, I, uh, I ended up getting a job at the guitar store where I, I took lessons from when I was a senior which was, was great. I was just kind of the, the helper guy, you know, I'd go tune the guitars and polish the guitars and tape. It was a, it was a store called guitar works. It was on Cary street in Richmond. It's not there anymore, but, uh, but I had such a, that, but that was an education too, because it, it had all these teachers, guitar instructors that would meet in the back room between lessons and then share, you know, share things with each other. And I was just there like tuning guitars or, or whatever I was doing, just listening to these guys that were all amazing. So that helped. Um, and then we eventually, the guys, we, we morphed into a band that could really play music. And so, uh, first time playing out, I was a senior and we played at our talent show in high school and, uh, played four songs. We played, uh, let me think here. Jumpin' Jack Flash, Stones, uh, Pinball Wizard, The Who, Knock on Heaven's Door, and then Johnny Be Good. Great and, uh, tunes, man. Nice selection. Yeah, it was fun. And I, a guy that we played with, his name was Jeff Sanborn. He had been playing for years, and we co- we coaxed him to be in our, in our band. He was our, he was just like way above us, and he took lessons from Mike too. But uh, so he played most of the solos at the time. But I did I did do the solo on Johnny Be Good, and I'll never forget that moment when the the curtain the curtain opened up and, you know, I just, I'll never forget that. But, uh, so, uh, after senior year, I, I, uh, actually got into music school at Virginia Commonwealth university and quickly realized that I, I had no business being in music school. <laughs> 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 I, uh, I had audition, I auditioned for the, uh, the, the, the head of the jazz guitar department and the head of the, the classical guitar department. And uh, <clears throat> I knew them from working at the guitar. I changed their strings on their guitar. So I knew them. And then I had good letters of recommendation from the store, but I got there and, and, you know, sitting there, I, you know, I'm just a rock and roll guitar player and sitting in class with people that been, been playing the cello since they were four that had perfect pitch and just, and so, and there were like there were like three or four of us rock and roll guitar players that got in, and then we just one by one just bailed. But so, uh, so were, were, was it more the musicians or more the teachers that really got like put on eighty six on what you were doing? No, the teachers didn't. I just I just realized you know I I didn't have the discipline to study, and I'll, I'll get to that later. And uh, but it, it was it was it was so challenging. It was like every day, you know, and I'm eighteen years old. And so every day was like a three hour music history, uh, theory class. And then you had to be in a chorus. You had to be able to sight sing, you know, you had to, uh, what else was it? There's, you, you'd have to learn how to play another instrument. It, it was just, and, and again, I just, I just wanted to play guitar to have fun and play it, you know, play rock and roll. So, I, uh, so the music department didn't have rock and roll guitar for fun one hundred and one or what? <laughs> no, no, I did. Have, I did have a private lesson. I had a private lesson once a week with a, with a guy, and uh, we we played blues, and uh, we played blues, and that, that was kind of fun. But uh, I remember a funny moment. I I uh, had an audition for this ensemble, and I got there with my guitar, and I looked through the window at the guy who was auditioning before me. And he had, the, he had the same guitar I had as Ibanez. And, uh, and he was, and there's like a room full of 30 people, you know, strings, horns, whatever. And this guy was getting screamed at by the instructor. And I was, I was watching through the window 
and the instructor was just screaming at him. So, so I just picked up my guitar and I left. <laughs> but, uh, so I, I, uh, left music school and then, uh, I worked construction for a little bit in Richmond and our, our band, the, the same kind of band from high school. We had, we had, most of those guys went to UVA and I was still living in Richmond and we started playing again. I would, I think I would drive up to UVA and we'd, we'd play some gigs. The band was called reality sandwich, uh, which I think I didn't make that name up, but it was, I thought it was a good name for a band, but, uh, so we played, it is. we played Charlottesville and, uh, they, they'd come back to Richmond. We played in Richmond sometimes and it was all classic rock covers. I think we had a, a few originals, but, uh, so then, uh, then I moved up to Charlottesville, uh, Virginia and went to the community college up there living with my UVA buddies. And I always say that I, uh, I socially went to UVA cause I lived with all the UVA buddies and I went to the fraternity parties and, but I was going to the community college up there. And, uh, Reality sandwich. We we play. We'd go to JMU and play in Hamden, Sydney, and then come back to Richmond and play downtown in Richmond. And we played a lot, and, and that kind of that kind of fizzled out as bands will do sometimes. And uh, I started this other band with some friends of mine called the Fire Ants, and we played harder. We like Jane's Addiction and Chili Peppers and Hendrix. That's quite a switch, man. Yeah, it was, it was, I just met these guys that were in that music, and I was kind of getting into that music, and so but we uh. <clears throat> we played in uh, not that many gigs. We, we didn't play that long. And then uh, summertime came and those guys left. I stayed in Charlottesville and then I ended up joining the Navy. <laughs> so I, That's a pretty big band to join, man. Yeah. Yeah. I joined the Navy. I just, I was, all my friends, all my friends are graduating from, from Virginia. And I was, I was, uh, I was managing a bartend and at, at a restaurant and I just, I didn't want to be doing that for the rest of my life. Not, not that there's anything wrong with that, but, uh, I just, I just felt like I needed to, to do something else. So joined the Navy and then got stationed here at uh, Virginia Beach at Oceana and just kept playing guitar. Wasn't really in a band uh, for while, while I was active duty. I was just too busy. And uh, then after I left active duty, uh, started a band here in uh, Virginia Beach. with the, It was called Free Flow. And that was... Uh, late nineties, 2000. And we did that for about four years. We played, played a lot in Norfolk and that, that was about four years and that went away. Then I joined a band called uh, big Brewster and the blue rocks. I'm not sure if you've heard of them, but they, uh, no, I haven't, but you yeah, know, they, I don't uh, know. uh, Bruce Brinkley was the leader of that band. And he, uh, I used to go see them before I was in the band. I saw them the like, years before they played the Baja in Sandbridge all the time. And I would go see them and uh, Bruce, you know, played harmonica, just a, a, a fabulous entertainer. And so, and they were already an established, it was the first time I ever joined a band, an established band. And uh, so I had to learn on these songs that I I'd never, I always refused I would ever play. So, and it was like the deal where like, Hey, we had a gig in two weeks. You got to learn 50 songs. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but you know, we played, you know, we played all all the songs that all the people make fun of, like Brown Eyed Girl and Mustang Sally. But I tell you what, we would that would fill up the dance floor, and that that's what that band was about, just making people have Absolutely. fun. Absolutely. And so I uh I did that band for about four years. That was a busy band. It was the first like we we were playing every every weekend, twice a weekend. And uh do you enjoy that that uh, that much gigging at, at any particular? I did, you know. At first, it overwhelmed me. When I first joined, it overwhelmed me because I was I was uh, I was in the reserves. I was uh, I was getting my I was getting my master's degree. I think at that time, uh, which was way easier than music school. Um, but uh, so I so I had reserves, you know, one one week in a month. And so Bruce said, "Hey, let me know when you can't play." And so I, I wrote down the, the one week in a month that I couldn't play and every other, he gave me the schedule and every other weekend was totally booked. And so it was, it was just a little, a little busy for me at that time. So I, I played, I played for half a season, maybe and by season, I mean like summertime. And then uh, I said, I can't do this. I got family stuff going on. I, I'm going to graduate school. Um, at reserves. It's, it's just, I'm just too busy. And, uh, I understand exactly what you're saying. Uh, from 86 to 96, uh, 
you know, my life was not my own. I was teaching uh, Chesapeake. I was teaching at Wesleyan. I got my master's degree. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, plus I was, I was playing with uh, either Cam or Jerry. Uh, of course, Tanya was there on both bands and we were booked every single weekend. Yeah. And it's almost like your life is not your own. No. And you and you really don't have enough time to, to develop a sense of self either. Right. Uh, in terms of, you know, where you want to actually take your original stuff or your stylings or whatever, you mm -hmm. know. So I understand. I, I'm totally understanding exactly where you're coming from. Yeah. Yeah. But I tell you what, that was that was a good education for me musically, because I typically all the bands I'd played in kind of did the same thing. Classic rock, um, blues, uh, but playing with uh, with Big Brewster, he played some some different kinds of songs that forced me to to play in a different way and learn how to play in a different way. And so that. Yeah. That, that's carried that's that's with me now still so I, i'm really but but anyway i quit and then the next year he called me back because his guitar player quit the, the one who replaced me and he said hey would you think about coming back and i said yeah because I, I really it was fun and I, and I missed it so i came back the next year and uh donna i don't know if you know donna Rowe. she's uh, uh i know donna i know of donna. okay yeah she was in the band then for a year and uh so she brought a whole different thing and you know, as, as far as she played acoustic guitar and just added vocals. And so that was, that was fun. Um, I think we played at the Neptune festival. I think we opened up for the band that opened up for Blackfoot. <laughs> but, uh, and we played at the Baja all the time. We, we played at weddings. Uh, and so I, that was, that was about three more years of doing that. And then, uh, let's see. So then I was out of a band for about a year and, uh, I said, I, I, I was like, I, I, I missed it. So I called guys from my two previous Virginia beach bands, uh, free flow and big Brewster and just, just got guys from those two bands and started, uh, the current band I'm in straight face. And so straight. That's, well, it's a good band, man. There's no doubt about it. You, yeah. you chose wisely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, and, and we're, we've been playing together. It's, it's hard to believe, but we it's over 14 years now we've been playing together and that's, it's uh, it's like a family. I mean, we all know each other's families, and we've all been through all kinds of stuff, you know, in our lives when we're still in this band. And and uh, so the drummer for for uh, for Straight Face is Bruce Bruce Brinkley's son, and that's how I met him. Really? Yeah, Griff Brinkley, phenomenal drummer. A generational thing going. Yeah, on. yeah, and uh, and then uh, Kurt Keim is our bass player. Uh, the original bass player was Matt Zimmer, who I played with in the Fire Ants in Charlottesville, but he was starting his family and stuff, and just this, the band was a little bit too much for him because he was having kids. Did and, you say Zimmer? Yeah, Matt Zimmer. Does he have a brother named um, Sam? Uh, I don't believe so. Because there's so. a guy named Sam Zimmer out of Richmond mm -hmm. that uh, used to come down and play uh, 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 charity gigs with Bob Smith. I thought uh, it might be related. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Matt, Matt's here. He's a, he and Kurt work together. They're engineers, but Matt now is an incredible bass player, and and Kurt's an incredible bass player. And then our singer and uh, uh, other guitarist is a guy named Barrett Wood, who uh, just just kills the guitar and, and kills the vocals. And, you know, he's got the hardest part of the, the, the gig, just learning all the vocals. And so, but yeah, it's been 14 years and I can't believe it. It's just uh, like, and, and, you know, we have, we have a gig coming up at the Baja on September 10th. And then we've got three in October at, at different benefits. And, and we, we, we don't, we're not super hard charging. You're not beating the streets to get gigs. But you're it, still loving the, getting together and doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And we, I think we like practicing more than we like playing out, but we wouldn't be able to practice unless we played out. So it's uh we just, it's a, it's almost like a support group. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, well, I got to ask you, man, was it the fact that you were in the Navy and, and evolving as far as rank and stuff in there, plus playing gigs, is that when you found enough money to actually become the gear, guitar, equipment <laughs> slut that you have become in your, in your, in your later years? That's probably part of it. Yeah. <laughs> That's part of it. Yeah. I, uh, because you, you, you've amassed a really, really nice collection of stuff. Certainly that, you know, a great launching pad for not only your playing, but your engineering. So. Yeah, yeah, I have uh, uh, I have a wall of guitar. I have a, so I, I'll get to this a little bit when we talk about one of my songs. But uh, I, I I left where, where you and I met with the Cosmopolitan in the town center. Uh, my wife Allison and I bought a house not too far away from from town center uh, in a neighborhood called Thalia Acres, where the, the restaurant Steinhilbers is. 
and uh, I turned one of my bedrooms into into the music slut gear room studio. So <laughs> I've got uh, nineteen guitars hanging on the wall. Um, I I have so many so I have so many pedals that I created the other guitar player's pedal board the same one he has with my pedals. So he doesn't have to bring anything. He just shows up to practice and grabs a guitar off the wall. And I got his same pedal board on my floor and then I've got my pedals. And then uh, I have a drum set that belonged to Bruce Brinkley and uh, now his son owns it, but he had an extra drum set that's in the room. So, and then I, I, I got one of those, uh, those tower PA systems. Um, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Plus, man, you got the lights and everything. You just went yeah, totally yeah. full blown, you know, which is excellent. You know? Well, I got my, 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 one of my best friends, Paul Sorensen. He, uh, he was in the original band back in high school, uh, a long time ago, but he, we're still great friends and he's, he owns Ruth's Chris Steakhouse here in, in, in uh, Virginia beach at town center. And he, he owns the one or his family does in, uh, in the one in Richmond. And he called me, he goes, Hey, I got something for you. And he'll stop, he'll come down in once a month or once every one, couple of months and he'll stop by and we'll have a beer or two, or I'll go see him in town center. He called me, he said, Hey, I got something for you. I said, okay, whatever. He said, come by the house. He goes, okay. And so he, he drove to the house and he texted me, he goes, Allison's going to hate me. I was like, Oh my God, what does he have for me? And he, he brings in a eight foot giant picture of Jimi Hendrix. Just, <laughs> it, was, it was it was bigger it was taller than my ceiling and uh so i i i made a project out of that and i put lights behind it and now that's in my in my studio but yeah i put lights in there and there's sound treatment on the walls and uh lots of microphones and but the guys the guys come over we practice here most of the time um and the guys just come over and, and i have a bass amp so kurt kurt just brings his bass and Barrett or, or uh, other guitar player, he, he just grabs a guitar off the wall. He, he's a Telecaster player and I have a Telecaster. So he usually plays that. You but, know, uh, it is, it is so nice to get to that stage where, where you have the gear and you have the spot, you have the, that, that, you know, that longevity of, of, of playing together that, you know, mm -hmm. if you can make it easy, which it, you certainly have done, yeah. uh, you know, that that's gotta be the absolute best. I can see why rehearsals are a ton of fun. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and we got lucky. My, my wife actually found this house and the property one. I, I'm, I'm sitting on almost an acre of, of just pine trees and it's just very private. And I didn't want to be the, the new guy in the neighborhood with the band making the noise and keeping people up. So uh, we were moving in and I asked Griff, my, my drummer, he was going to come help me move. He had a truck and he's going to help me move. And I said, I said, hey, Griff, can you bring a snare drum out to my house? He's like, what? I said, can you just bring a snare drum? And so he helped move and then he, he went up with a snare drum in the place where I envisioned the drum set would be. And I said, just beat the snare drum. And I called him on my phone. And I walked around my yard and I couldn't hear the snare drum through the house. So I, oh, it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. Yeah. So it, uh, and then again, I, I said, I, I put sound treatment on the walls and it's, uh, you, you need to come over and jam with me in here, man. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I look forward to that time, man. Yeah, I do. But uh, let's see. Yeah, that's about that's about my uh, that's that's my musical journey. I'm still uh, still reservist. Um, I'm a defense contractor as well. Uh, I'm just busy with music. I just uh, love music and I can't get away from it. Well, I know, that was probably a, a pretty good time for us to at least talk about uh, the intersection of our lives. Yes. Um, uh, Barry and I didn't meet each other. We met through Allison, uh, his wife. Um, both of us lived at the Cosmopolitan. Uh, I lived on the 10th floor. He lived on the 14th floor. Uh, they have a dog. Uh, his name is Cosmo and I have Barry and, uh, Allison walk was walking Cosmo one day and I bumped into her. We just got into a nice, Hey, we both live at the Cosmo kind of conversation. She mentioned Barry and, and his music. And all of a sudden, you know, the conversation took off and, and Allison decided, okay, I'm going to get these guys together. So she made her made some nice drinks and a, and a nice little cheese plate and all the rest of that stuff and left us in a room, you know, uh, 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 one of the days following our conversation. And it was great right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, you know, you were working, I think you were at that time in the, in the, in the early stages of figuring out what garage band was all about and trying this, that, and the other. And, 
and MIDI, mm-hmm. and you were just all over the place. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, I said, let's, you, this, but the stuff that you were doing and, and the stuff that you showed me, I knew that there was something here. I knew that there was something that we could work together on. And it just so happened that at that time, uh, a 10 and 14 was being developed. Yep. And you came in on that and, Man, that was that was an explosion of incredibly nice uh, impromptu creativity, uh, and it, you know it was it was all that that lead was just all over the place. Good, oh, thanks. Uh, so, uh, so that was the, that was when we actually met together mm-hmm. uh, for the very first time. Uh, we actually recorded in the Cosmopolitan yep. in, my, in my home studio there. So, I mean that that's a great place. You know that uh, for us uh, and a great way for us to start our relationship. Yeah, absolutely.
but you have taken it uh, to um, a completely different place now. I can remember when we, uh, when we would talk at, at, after the fact because everybody gets busy. You were still, you know, doing heavy navy stuff, and you know, I was I was still uh, uh, working uh, uh, my jobs as well. But at the end of the day, uh, you seem you seem to turn a corner in terms of I'm going to work with with this particular DAW and MIDI to working with a more sophisticated programming system and or a workstation and starting to get into loops. Yep. So c- could you, you know, explain how that transition took place for you? So I, uh, in 2015, I released an album called Occasional Peach, The Occasional Peach. And I had, it was, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know about how to adjust your DB level to get it ready for mastering. I didn't, you know, I'd mix it with my headphones, which now I know you can't just do that. You have to listen to it in multiple, multiple things. Um, but I, I'll stand by the song, right? I, I think, I, I think I did an okay job writing the songs that I wrote, but uh, yeah. so that was 2015. And there's one song on there and I didn't send it to you for this, but it's called fields of Sco. And it was kind of just a, I spent the least amount of time in this song, but I used loops. I used, yeah. uh, and, and the premise of the song. And so Sco is John Schofield, one of my favorite guitar players, jazz guitar players of all time. And it was, uh, the, the vision of the song was, it was a, a live concert watching John Schofield. And I, I can't play like him, but I tried a little bit. I just try to get the tone that he gets and the, he uses a chorus in a certain way. And so I, I had the, the piano were, were loops and they were loops uh, off of Logic Pro X, which is what I use. It's the, yeah. it's the, the Mac version of uh, Pro Tools. And there's just thousands of great loops. But I put these put this song together using loops uh, for, I think, everything except for the guitar. And I put in crowd noise and then I made, <clears throat> I made it sound like something interesting was happening that, the crowd gets excited when the guitar goes up. And again, I spent the least amount of time doing this, Tom. I just, it was just kind of an extra song I wanted to put in there. And, uh, but that was my first real experience with loops. So fast forward to 2018, maybe I, I was looking at my bank account and there was a deposit. So I go through this company called CD baby to release my music. Yeah. And they partner with all the, you know, iTunes or Spotify and just, a bunch of them, but uh, I, I released this album and I just kind of forgot about it. And then like 2019, I guess, 18, 19, I look at my bank account and there's a deposit from CD baby. And it was like 50 bucks, but I was like, and I, I was like, what is this? I don't, what is, I wonder what this is. And so I, I couldn't remember my password to CD baby. So I had to go back and figure out how to get back on there. It, but it was royalties. That's right. Royalty time, it was man. Royalties Absolutely. From that one song. And it was getting played in India a ton. <laughs> you got to love them, man. So I'm like, got to love the Indians. And then I got another one, you know, the next quarter I got a bigger one and the next quarter I got a bigger one. And I'm still getting, I'm still getting royalties from that one song that I spent the least amount of time on. Um, so that just kind of planted a seed with the loops. And so now uh, I'm doing that a lot now. And uh, there's a lot of people in India. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, to tell you the truth, uh, uh, the podcast that we're doing right now mm-hmm. is part of a series. Uh, the The number one, I guess you could say, audience that I have is uh, Great Britain, uh, France, Germany, India, uh, and Australia. Yeah. And more people are listening in India than any other country. I mean, I, uh, uh, I love it. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, let's put those billion people on the right course. Here. Exactly. Well, I just think it's amazing because I, I, you know, my, I'm still was re- – uh, most recent release that I did, Eat by Bears, which we'll talk about later. I uh, I joined all these Facebook groups, and so I get likes and like from Africa, from India, and then I go on like uh, what is it? Spotify for artists. When you see who's listening to your yeah. song, and there's like France, yeah. France, Netherlands, Mexico, Canada. And it's just it's just. I mean, if you'd have told me forty years ago that people in India or France or wherever Africa listening to my music, I wouldn't have believed it. I just think that's amazing. Just- it is amazing. And, you know, who knows where somewhere down the line when all of a sudden uh, 
uh, you know, the roulette table happens to have the ball land in your spot and all of a sudden things just kind of take off. You yeah. never can tell no, not, yeah. uh, when that's going to happen, especially in the world in which we live. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So, well, th also at this time, man, when you're into that, uh, when you started to switch over, you shared, you were very high on one particular song called Arlington. Mm -hmm. uh, you shared that with me. I know you've gone through several different versions. You also, uh, you know, had a collaboration uh, with, uh, uh, with Powell. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and so uh, uh, tell us about that and, you know, what's the song about and why did, why did that song have so much, I guess you could say, uh, it's almost like a benchmark moment for you. Yeah. So Arlington, I, so pre COVID I was, I was uh, doing some active duty, duty time and I was working at the Pentagon. <clears throat> and so I would, uh, I would leave Virginia beach on a Monday morning and go to work at the Pentagon and come back on Friday, that kind of thing for, for about a month, maybe a month and a half. And, uh, at that same time, I started messing around with the main riff of the song. And I think, I think I played it for you when I, when I recorded the loops, the, the loops for you. Yes. Um, I think I, I messed around with it and actually part, I think part of the song is part of those loops. Um, but, uh, I just came up with the, the riff and I really, really, really liked it. And so I eventually got the song together and, you know, it's, there's no loops on that song. Um, just all guitars and playing bass, all the guitars. And then I, for the drums, I use a, a program called tune track. It's uh, by a company. I think it's called novation, but it's, it's MIDI drums. So you just pick, yeah. you can manipulate all the drums. And uh, so I got the song together and I was like, I was so excited about it. And, and I, I sent it to you as, as I often do with songs and thank God for you because you gave me honest feedback and you said, it's a great song, Barry, but something's wrong with the drums. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. sure you go to Tom. Give it to me straight. No, it's like, <laughs> and so I, I couldn't hear, I couldn't hear that there any, there's anything wrong with the drums. I listened to it and I thought, I was like, well, no, I think he's, there's like a reverb part that was making it weird. And so I fixed, I tried to fix it. And then I'm like, I just, I, just, I think when you listen to your music so much, you know, music you record, it just gets in your head. And there's no, you know, I think, I think it's a, a psychological thing. It is. I understand which exactly what you're saying. Yeah. And so I shelved it. I put it aside and I, I started, you know, working on other music. And then, uh, 2020, which I mentioned, we, Allison and I bought this house and I put a studio in it and I got this nice vintage drum set. And then that was during COVID. And so one of the, one of the guys in the band had a, a family member that was high, high risk. So we didn't practice. We stopped practicing. We stopped playing. We had to cancel gigs. It yeah. just, you know, during, during that time when, when COVID was at, at its highest. It's a rough time. Yeah, absolutely. So I, but I said, you know, I got a drum set in my house. I'm gonna take drum lessons. And so I, uh, I contacted alpha music. I, that's, that's my, I go, I love the guys at alpha alpha music's the best store ever. Oh yeah. Um, and, uh, actually I contacted Powell, Powell teaches lessons, Powell Randolph. I'm talking about, uh, oh, yeah. the great Powell Randolph. He, uh, it's amazing. guy. Oh my God. He, uh, he, I, I contacted him and I started taking lessons with Powell and just, just some of the stuff he would show me that it was just amazing. It was just phenomenal. And, uh, but we, we became friends and, you know, I, I, I got what I could get out of being a, you know, I can play the drums now a little bit. I'm not great, but uh, I can do fills and I can keep a beat a little bit. But uh, we were having a conversation after one of my lessons, and he uses Logic Pro X as well as, as a digital audio workstation. And so I just I asked him, I said, hey, if I sent you a song, could you put real drums on it? He said, sure. I got it all set up. In my, I got microphone set up in my house. And so I wasn't even thinking about a song. So I got home and I started going through the songs that I, I was kind of working on or had worked on. And there's Arlington. And so I said, perfect. The drums are not right. I don't understand it. I'm going to give it to Powell. And uh, so I sent the song to Powell. And he said the same thing you said. He said, yeah, the drums aren't right on this. <laughs> so so I, I actually hired Powell. As for, first and only person I've ever hired is a studio musician. And uh, he, uh, he sent me back 14 drum tracks. 
Really? 14, and the song is only nine tracks. So now I got 14 drum tracks to mix. It's, it was amazing. It was unbelievable. It's like the bottom of the snare, the top of the snare, right room mono, left room mono. He put congas on there. It was, it was just unbelievable what he did. And then, so well, you, you sent that to me mm -hmm. and the thing that most impressed me about what, what you had done is not only working with Powell, which I, I've worked one uh, live gig with Powell and it, it was, it was too much fun. It was great. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the thing is, is that you have this dual guitar thing going on, uh, electric rhythm and electric lead, which is really, really, uh, it was mixed well to begin with. But at the end of the day, uh, I really didn't, didn't feel it or see it or hear it mm -hmm. until, until that foundation uh, rhythm section was, yeah. was intact. Oh yeah. And man, it made all the difference in the world. It, it allowed, it allowed for the song to have that, that full composure and allowed your electric guitar to cut through in the nicest way. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, which I, which I thought, which of course, you know, that also enhances your, uh, the ease of engineering mm -hmm. and, and the fun that's involved with it. Because you really, when you got guys like Powell working for you, you really don't have a whole lot of, mm -mm. of, 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 you know, you don't have a lot uh, of making up of, you know, or, or doing kind of weird things to fix things. Yeah. It's already done right.
And I, I saw after that, I was like, hey, this is a this song is a Powell Randolph song. It's not a Barry Shewitt song anymore. This year. But, uh, well, I, well, I, well, I would take issue yeah. with that. But the thing is, man, is that uh, he made a big difference. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I think it really, uh, it, it, that particular song, once he got involved, became a benchmark moment in terms yeah. of uh, how you actually look at your engineering. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, so that was, that was Arlington. And uh, so that's, uh, earlier this year, I released an album called Amalgam, which is a collection of songs I've been working on for the last three or four years. And I just picked pick eight songs that I liked, Arlington being, I think that's the title track. Uh, and then I, I went back and I, I found some old songs that I liked that I forgot about. I don't know if you ever yeah. do that. Um, and just remastered, remixed them. And so Arlington is a, is my last uh, solo album. It's, it's uh all instrumental. Um, I'm not a singer. I sing in my band. I sing backup and I, and I sing a couple songs in my band, but I'm not a, I'm not a singer song like you. I don't, I just, I'm not comfortable with my voice. So I read it. Well, but, but, but it, it established your, it established your versatility and established your style, mm-hmm. you know, and it also gave you that chance to really get into engineering. I mean, you could, you could play on stage and get your amps right, but that ain't like, uh, you know, working with uh, miking it in a studio and, and getting that blend that you want to have there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, so uh, so that that whole process just really cemented the, an entire, you know, engineering uh, pathway for you, which I think is wonderful. Yep. And, and you, uh, so what I do, what it, and this is kind of a recent thing, is uh, so I, I do most of it. On, I have a nice set of headphones, you know, but. You know, talking to you and, and just understanding that that's that's gonna. And I think you said this. That's gonna get you close, but it's not gonna get you all the way. So with Arlington, I would actually take my Mac and sit in my car and plug it into my stereo system in my car just to hear how it sound in my car. Yeah. And then I would uh, I had this Bose Bluetooth speaker in my house, and so I'll Bluetooth my computer into this Bose speaker in my den, and then I'll listen to it. So, uh, and then I like they turn the bass up or the drum, the snare's too loud or the hi hat's too loud. And then I'm very fortunate to be married to Allison because she's a classical pianist and she has a great ear. So she, and she is very honest about my music. So I'll play something for her over the Bluetooth and she'll tell me, she says, it sounds muddy. And I'll say, what sounds muddy? And she's like the bass or, or what she'll give me great feedback. And then I'll fix yeah. it. And she, so she's kind of my, my litmus test. She's like, it sounds. And so I released a, I, I released a video last night, um, a new Eat by Bear song. It's not released on Spotify or anything, but I just put a video out. And I just, I, I make her listen to it first. <laughs> and it's like, does this sound well, muddy? Yeah, well, well, Tanya's the same way. Yeah. I mean, you know, I respect her opinion and her criticisms. Uh, and she's been totally honest with me the entire time. And it's made, especially on stuff like vocals, it mm-hmm. has made uh, a really big difference yeah. in, in the way that I approach things and my ability to not only, uh, I guess you could say, put it together, but also to work with other people to put it together. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I listen to them, too, just as much as I do to her. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's a good thing to have a woman that not only is good at what she does, but understands exactly what you're shooting for. Yep, yep. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, let's take a look at uh, another one of your songs here, 1984. Uh, I listened to this uh, for the last few days. Um, it's a really nice departure. It has a new feel on your rhythm, a new feel on the guitars, and it, it really uh, accents uh, using keyboards uh a lot more than you used to. It feels good, and the keyboard parts are strong. Yeah, those are uh, those are all loops. Um, yeah, so that that was the so my my most recent project is called Eaten by Bears. That's the band, the fake band name, and I I had I just kind of this is volume one, volume right? one. But I, I, all right, I came up with the concept of I need a, I need a band, I need a name, not me, not Barry Shoemate. I need some kind of band name, and I don't know what that is. <clears throat> and that'll give me a little bit of freedom to do weird things or things that would nor- you know not norm not not what I'm usually associated with. I hope that makes sense. But uh it does. So I came up with the name. I don't know how I came up with the name. I just came up with it. Eaten by bears. My name is Bear. I don't know. But I started saying Allison. I was like, Eaten by bears, Allison, eaten by bears. She's like, what are you talking about? It's like <laughs> you're gonna know what I'm talking about pretty soon. And uh so and then I, so I I would come up with other names and I'd come home and I'd 
Google it. And there's a band name called that. So I, I came home and I looked up Eaten by Bears and there's no band called Eaten by Bears that I know of or I could find on the internet. So I bought the rights to eatenbybears.com. So I own it. And, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but before, before I had come up with that concept, the song 1984 you're talking about. So I have a, yeah. a good friend named Jim Quick. I don't know if you did Jim. He's a bass player. And he was a ba- he was in a band here called the Lemmings and Spacer. I've heard of the band, but I don't yeah, know. Him. Yeah, Jim's a good friend of mine. He's a uh, great guy. Uh, teaches at Lansdown, uh, but uh, he plays in a band now called Radio Eighties, and they're an eighties cover band. They're they're great. And uh, I was just having a conversation him with him on tax about music and stuff. And so I just got in my head about eighties, eighties, eighties. So nineteen eighty four, I decided I wanted to write an eighties song. That, that was my goal. That's what I wanted to do just for the fun of it. I wasn't thinking about eating my bears. Then I wasn't thinking about releasing it. I just it did it as an exercise. And, uh, I have a, a good friend who I collaborate with. Uh, his name is Monty Jones up in Richmond and he's a, he teaches at BCU and he was my, he was a drummer of mine a long time ago, or we, we played bands. We, we grew up learning how to play music with each other. And he's, uh, He's a vibraphone player. He's getting into the same kind of stuff that, that I'm doing with the, the loops and the MIDI and, and the, the different kind of stuff just with vibraphones. And so we, we collab. I play on his music. He plays on my music sometimes. But I sent him that. He's like, I think I sent him that song. No, he sent me a song to work on. And I said, I can't. I'm busy writing a song for Beverly, Beverly Hills Cop 3. And that was the joke of that 80s song. <laughs> <laughs> and... uh <laughs> and he came back. He said, "That's not like '80s. It sounds like it sounds like Daft Punk." And I, I didn't know what Daft Punk was, so I looked that up. A, I've never heard of Daft Punk. It's a band. It's a band that has that plays music like that.
And so I'm like, okay. And then the more I listened to it, the more I liked it. And then, uh, so then I started the next song and then I started the next song and then I started the next, and then all of a sudden I had seven, seven, eight songs. And I'm like, I said, you know what? I'm going to release this stuff. I like it. And, uh, it's, it's really a, it's really a forum that allows me to play guitar ever. Cause a lot of it, you know, I, there's, there's every guitar you hear is me playing guitar and, and then, and then playing bass on a lot of it too. Well, let me, let me, let me move on to another song, uh, song number six, mm-hmm. uh, on, uh, you know, the soon to be eaten by bears volume one. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would have, I would have thought that that after Arlington, that that would have been after listening to it, I thought that that might've been the first one that you actually took on because it has a minimalist, uh, kind of, uh, essence to mm-hmm. it, uh, uh, it, compared to the other tracks that are going to be on, that you've gotten done that you sent me that are going to be on the album. Yeah. Uh, uh, it has a, a loop vocal thing going on mm-hmm. there. It, the, the trap set is minimal, but really, well, it really has great tone. Um, and the guitar in the second half of the song, song is is some of the most some of the best work you've done in recent times. Oh, I think it's Thank really you. very tasty. So I mean, so I thought that maybe you know that you you backed off on the, on the fuller sound a little bit to to allow your guitar to 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 float through a little bit more. Yeah. And to me, it it works really really well. Oh, thank you, thank you. That song, uh, yeah, that's that's definitely a different slower song than the rest of the songs on the the Volume One album. Uh, and one of my, I know it probably doesn't sound anything like this, but one of my huge influences uh, is Steely Dan. And so the, oh, the beginning with the piano, with the phaser on the piano and the drum, mm-hmm. the drums just following it. The drums aren't really playing a beat, but the drums are just kind of emphasizing the piano part. Um, that's what I really was striving for. And then it comes, it goes into like the funky faster part and then it goes back into the slower part. And that's, yeah. that's just kind of my, it's a, it's, it's a pattern that I, I use a lot, but uh, I, w- I was happy with that one. And, uh, it's called song number six because that was the sixth one that I wrote for this album. Even though it's track number seven, which I just did that to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> my my bass, Kurt, my bass player said, is I love that song number six is the, the seventh song.
Well, that's just the rebel in you, man. Mm-hmm. Just uh, putting it out there that way. That's just the way you are. Well, it, sound, it sounded better. I listen because when I, I, you probably do the same thing. Once you get a bunch of songs, you want to see how they sound with each other. That's right. It takes a while yeah. to actually get the the song where people don't understand that. It's not like you just throw it all out there. Yeah. Uh, most most albums have a a logic or a some kind of thematic mm-hmm. something going on in the back of your head that says this was going to be first and this was going to follow and so forth. Yep. Yep. For Amalgam, I had. It's like three pieces of paper on the coffee table next to, you know, in the den with all the songs. And it's like right next to them was numbers that were scribbled out because I just listened like, this is number one. No, this is number one. And so it took a long time for that process. But that's for the volume one album. I thought song number six sounded better in the seventh spot. Well, whatever works, dude, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. All right. Get out of here. Tell me about that one. Get out of here was this. That was the seventh song. That was actually the seventh song. And that was, there's, there's really no, so I think I told you, we were talking on the phone last night, like I write songs 20 seconds at a time. I don't, okay. I don't, I don't sit with a pen and paper. I sit with my computer and I, uh, typically, um, at least with this last stuff. And so I have a process. Well, I got, I got written in my notes here. I said, uh, what were you, what were you shooting for with this one? Because there's a syncopated uh, electronic music thing mm-hmm. that's a lot, a uh, lot more syncopated than the other stuff that you had. Yeah. Uh, as a, the other stuff is a much more free flowing mm-hmm. kind of thing. Uh, this one had uh, a lot of syncopation, and I didn't know whether you were just kind of high on that particular kind yeah, of thing at that time or what. Whatever, so whatever. So like you said, I write songs twenty seconds at a time. So I, I I'll typically put down a, a drum, whatever, a, a drum uh-huh. or, or beats, and. Um, and then I'll I'll put a bass bass on it, and then I'll stretch those out, you know, for thirty seconds to a minute, and I'll just listen to it over and over again until my brain tells me to add something else, or my brain tells me to to change something, and I do that through the whole song.
and then I'll listen to the next day. I'm like, oh, this, I, just, I don't know what I was doing last night, and I'll change it. But uh, <laughs> I, I – uh, What the hell was yeah, I thinking? Yeah, yeah. But, but that song, Get Out of Here, what I liked about that is – there's a guitar over the whole song, like a, a, a really airy guitar that's playing the whole yeah. thing. And oh, so yeah. uh, I, I, I like that. Was, what's funny about that one song is all the rest of the songs are wave files on the album. Mm-hmm. I could not, I, and I use this uh, program called ozone to master my music. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I had this song and I, I liked the song. I was happy with it. And then I would master an ozone and, I don't know why, but it was always quieter than the other songs. And I, I couldn't figure it out. I, would, I, and I turned it way up in Logic Pro and I, I just did everything I could. And it was always quiet. So I just released it as an MP3, which you hear on the record is an MP3 because that was louder. And uh, if, you, if you if you listen to it and you know that, you'll hear it. But I don't think most people, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Well, I have a good buddy who uh, does a lot of uh, electronic uh, rock and new age kind of music named Steve Peppas. Do you know Steve? No, I don't know Steve. He's been around. He was the he was the engineer, one of the engineers. Him and Jim Michaels engineered the Songsmith album way back in the day, and he's still at it. He's he's made a really good living, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in the business of music, which is very very difficult to oh, do yeah, around yeah. here. But uh, uh, that is that is his style. He has you know he's got at least uh, you know eight or nine albums out, and th- th- that is his mainstay. Mm-hmm. And it reminded me an awful lot of, of the kind of stuff that Steve did, simply because that's his genre. Right. right.
Yeah, yeah. That's it's uh I think the I think the genre of what I'm doing right now is called trip hop. Not hip hop, but trip hop. I think that's what it's called. Trip hop. Yeah, T R I P hop. But uh I don't know. I don't listen to this kind of music. I just it's weird. I just record I like it. I like to record it. It's fun. And uh the people are seeming to you know they seem to enjoy it, the people that I'm Well, you know, maybe you're having like multiple crossover moments here, man. You never you never can't tell where this thing's gonna lead oh, you. Oh, I know, I know. I uh it's uh, it's you should see the people who follow me. This it's it's not that many, but they're uh, they're a mixed bag. They're a mixed bag of of the the earth of the the whole world. So it's it's just neat. Like I said earlier, it's just neat. It is. Somebody, a, a guy from Cameroon liked my music the other day. I'm like holy crap! Well, I got one more song I want to talk over with you, and that's Drone. Mm-hmm. Trent, um, uh, I. Uh, I got it in my notes. To me, it's uh, uh, the best use of bass and keyboards that you have in, in that particular string of songs that you're going to put out with uh, "Eaten by Bears." Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's really strong. The guitar is really tasty, and but it, it's also more rhythmic. Yeah. Uh, than uh, that uh, takes a part of uh, uh, more rhythmic than it does lead, and I think it, the, the whole song blends together really well. You engineered that one really well. Thank you, thank you. Um, that was the last song that I did for. You know, I had I had seven songs. I needed. I, I, for some reason, I feel like you have to have eight songs at least to release an album. Um, so that was the last song I did, and I did it. I did the whole thing in one one night. Um, you know, recorded it, mixed, mixed it, and mastered it in one night, and then uh, listened to it the next day and was happy with it. And that's the that's the title track of the record. And that's if you go to my YouTube, I have a YouTube channel, uh, Barry Shoemate Music. That automatically pops up, and that has the most hits and. Uh, uh, yeah, I was, I was really happy with that one, and I pretty i i uh, have videos for all my songs on my YouTube channel, most of my songs. That's, but, a, uh, that's a great thing to get yeah. into. I mean, people, there are a lot of people who prefer whether it's a whether it's a visual thing or just simple audio. That uh, YouTube music is uh, it's really got quite an audience. Oh yeah, yeah, it's uh, uh, and uh, so uh, that's a good that's a good place to go, man. Yeah, and there's a, a CD Baby, the company that I use. I use them. Do you too. use them? Yeah. So they, oh, they, yeah. uh, they've evolved into such a great, like they have all these tools that help you. And, and so one of the tools is a, it's called Rotor and it's a video development thing. So you, you, up, you uh-huh. upload your song to this and then you can pick your style and your clips or you can upload your own clips to it. And so I, I've, I've really got, really enjoyed making videos for my songs and, uh, it's just, it's a lot of fun. And uh, you can remix it and you can change things. You can add words. So it always says, you know, eaten by bears and the song title. Um, but it's just a neat, it's just a neat thing. It's just it, all the tools that are available to us these days. It's just incredible. Well, the neat thing also is like, uh, unlike a, a website, which usually has an annual fee or something, when you put it on YouTube, it's there forever. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, so the music will always be able to be accessed and stuff by, by people who you know have an interest in, in what you're doing and everything. Mm-hmm. So, well, listen, brother, um, this has been great. It, I mean, I know that you're with Straight Face. I know that you, that you guys are, are playing on not as much on like on a week by week basis, but yeah, what's uh, is the Baja is the Baja the place that you all enjoy the most? Is that the place where people can actually see you guys and have the most fun? Yeah, yeah, the Baja's the that's, that's our first gig was at the Baja at our drummers. Was, uh, our drummer got married there. Griff got married there, and uh, fourteen years ago or so, and, and uh, we played. We had just started playing, so we played. The, it was actually our first gig. We played there, and we shared the stage with his dad's band, uh, Big Brewster, which was just a neat moment. And that's typically in the summer. The uh, the guy Jim Reeves, the guy who owns it, calls us late late winter, early spring, to get us on the books. Um, like once, once a month. And then in the, in the fall, there's, there's three events typically they have out there. One's the, uh, there's a, you know, the, the park across the street from the Baja is in Sandbridge. Yeah. There's a pig picking event there on September 10th during the day. So it's all these pig, you know, trailer beer trucks and it just gets insane. And then everybody after that ends comes over to the Baja to listen to the music. So it gets insane. Like, like really insane. So we're playing that. Um, last October, we played Halloween there. Halloween's always a great show there. Just a sea of people. Everybody's dressed up, having a good time. Um, in the summer, it's it's hit or miss, you know, because you have the tourists yeah. out there, and you don't know if uh, 
you know, you never, you never know in the summer, just like a regular summer, summer day. Cause you know, the tourists, they might be tired from, from being on the beach all day or they might be raring to go. Uh, the last time we played there was in July. <clears throat> Wasn't a huge crowd, but the people there were really having fun. And that, that's what counts. You know, it, it doesn't matter. Oh, absolutely. Like, we, we, I mean, they're paid, they're taking their, they want to have fun, but they're taking their time and they're taking their money to be with you. Yeah, and yeah. so they, they deserve, you know, a band that'll give them a good yep, time. Yep. And we, we do that. And we, we had, uh, we've had some just incredible, phenomenal shows out there. And, and, uh, we had a great show years ago. I think you came to it this at the uh, Why Not Wednesday in Town Center. Absolutely, that was uh, that was that was amazing. Um, and they put, like I said, we played Neptune Festival a few times. And so you guys sounded good that yeah, day. Yeah, thank you, thank you. We had uh, we had the, the sound guy was uh, actually I don't know if you remember a, ba- a band called the Funk Junkies in the nineties. No, <laughs> but uh-huh. it, was, it was this, this band. Uh, we had some videos uh, on MTV, but the, the sound guy was the bass player of the Funk Junkies, who I used to follow. And I didn't know that when he was doing sound for us. But, uh, but that was a good show. But, uh, yeah, the, the, to answer your question, the Baja is pretty much what we do. So outside of your website and now your YouTube channel, mm-hmm. and you also have Facebook, I know you're on Instagram. Uh, what place uh, would you say is the best place for people to get all the information that they need or to have the most in time just enjoying your music? Um, I would say, I'd say my Facebook page, uh, either Barry okay. Shoemate or uh, Eaten by Bears. I've not, I've not built a Eaten by Bears uh, website yet. You know, I, okay. but I plan to. Um, but I'm all, all three of my record, you know, the occasional peach and amalgam and eat my bears are all on all the streaming sites, you know, Spotify, iTunes, uh, Apple music. Right. Um, just that's, that's the service CD baby gives you, um, straight face, straight, straight face has a, a website. It's called straightfaceband.com, And there's some pictures and some music and our gig schedules on there. Uh, our bass player, Kurt, runs that and we have also a facebook page uh but that yeah those are the places uh it's pretty easy i also googled my name the other day and it came up first where did it come up oh absolutely it you, came you, up you type you type in barry shoemate music and you're all over the place yeah man. yeah it's it's, it's kind of weird it's kind of weird and i'm a, I'm a band camp too uh uh for, for band camp i'm gonna eat, eat my bears and the occasional peach are on band camp but I, I don't want people to pay. It's like seven dollars, and I had some people buy it. I'm like, you don't have to do it. It's free. You, just, you download it for free. I don't want to. The, the royalties will catch up to me if they catch up to me. I don't want you to spend your money. But uh, it was nice. It was nice that they did that. Well, listen, man, this has been absolutely great. Uh, I've been wanting to do this for forever. I, you know, and I've been wanting to come over to your place and, and jam. Yeah, for, you have forever. to forever. But you You're know, Tanya, both. If it, well, if it ain't one thing, it's another. But uh, we're we're gonna make sure that this 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 jam and this just you know staying better in touch face to face is gonna happen because I I really enjoy uh, you know I really enjoy the session work that we've done and I I, I really I just like to have some time just to, to fart around oh, and, yeah. you know yeah. bring over my acoustic and my lap steel and just we'll just have ourselves a good time. Yeah, absolutely, Tom. You're welcome anytime. Well, listen, man, it, this has been a pleasure. Um, just make sure you give Allison a hug for me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, same, same thing with, with Cosmo. Same with Tanya and, uh, and Barry, man. It's, uh, I am so, it was, it was such a, a happy accident that Allison ran to you walking the dogs. And, and now we have this, this awesome relationship of recording music. And I, I think it's going to continue. And, uh, Oh, absolutely, man. I, I don't see, I don't see it stopping. I see us both, uh, both of us evolving into all kinds of really, really nice stuff as time goes on. So, uh, just uh, make sure you take good care of yourself, and uh, I'll see you next time around, brother. All right, man. Thanks, Tom. Thanks so much for having me on here. I really appreciate it. All right. I enjoyed it, buddy. Thanks, brother. Bye. Bye. This episode was produced by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick, edited and mixed by Alton Riddick for Edit Your Truth. On behalf of Tom... This is Alton signing off until we meet again on The Path Taken. Mm-hmm.